Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are talking about Remo. I am joined by Herbie May, who is a 32-year veteran of the Remo Company. Herbie, how are you, man? I'm great, Bart. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you about drumheads. Me too. And I'll uh, I'll say that there has been a, as we know, there's been a previous episode that was the history of drumheads, which we we kind of focused more on Evans. And um, this is sort of the opportunity to to get the Remo side of the story. And they're both obviously, you know vital pieces of drumming history but um today we're talking remo so so yeah herbie why don't we um why don't we just have you take us back to the beginnings of uh remo and we can start at the beginning and go all the way through uh to modern day okay well um uh, hopefully like i said this is actually my first podcast so i have to say it's uh, a little different for me i'm used to demonstrating physical things while I'm talking or sure. you know, showing someone graphics or something. So it's a little bit different, but um, I'm, I'll try to uh, stick to the agenda and try not to ramble too much because um, our company is really, uh, you know, we, we have so much history. You have over 60 years. And, um, you know, we it, it's sort of divided into some segments. The first part of it is, um, you know, Remo Belly being a, a touring drummer, uh, you know, moving to L.A. kind of, um, to me, it's 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 really a Cinderella story about, you know, this guy who, who was a drummer who ended up, you know, um, uh, doing uh, getting a drum shop together, you know, playing Hollywood, doing things with uh, with movie stars and uh, and then starting his own company. So um, I wanted to talk just for a second about the actual film, because, you know, the film, the polyethylene terephthalate. There I said it. That is the uh, that that's the actual uh, film that was developed back in the uh, in the the late 30s is really when it when it when it happened around 1938. There was a guy named Wallace Carruthers who was who was a, a polymer chemist. He worked at uh, Dupont. He he is really credited uh, for doing nylon, but he first started with polyesters. And um, then I switched to nylon. Then um, there was these two other guys in the UK that had read all of Wallace's notes and details on nylon and polyesters that he was working on. And they actually developed uh, this film, uh, which later became, um, they called it um, Terraline. Hmm. And um, so they they were the actual guys that developed it, and they... Um, the the actual what they call PET now the polyethylene terephthalate. So yeah, so they were the ones that actually uh, came up with it, but but it was through Wallace Carruthers, um, you know, who who sort of started the thing. Okay. Yeah. So then um, they they worked for a small research lab, and they uh, the company that they worked for, um, you know, did not want to really uh, do any development to it. So they licensed it to um, to DuPont in, in the United States. And so DuPont uh, actually started making this film and then um, and then ICI ended up, which which make, makes Melanex. And by the way, those two films, uh, Melanex is made by ICI and Mylar is made by DuPont. Those two films are still films that we use today because they have um, certain sound properties that are very unique. And um, so anyway, I've worked with a number of their chemists over the years from around the world, and uh, their help has just been incredible. Remo Belli has said many times that, you know, DuPont did some things for us to help improve, um, you know, help improve our drum heads. And um, they were intrigued, I think, by the sound properties as well. I find it interesting that at that point, that in the very beginning, that there was just nothing to do with drums when this sort of film was was created. Well, let me interrupt you there sure. for a second because you would think that, but actually, um, Dupont and Dupont's patent. Okay, so we're talking about these patents that were done back in the um, back in the late uh, '30s, early '40s. Dupont had a patent for. Um, uh, for uh, polymers in the 40s and then um, ICI in the mid 40s. So you would think that, that no one knew about it, but actually in DuPont's patent application in 1951, 
uh, the actual potential products listed in that patent application in 1951 was snare drum and bass drum heads. Wow. Cool. <laughs> I had no yeah. idea. I thought it was like yeah. 1956 was kind of the when, when it really came to a head, and that's when it became, hey, let's use it for this. But, man, well, they knew right away. Yeah. Right. They knew right away, and there was a whole list. I actually have the copy of the patent. There's a, a whole list of products that they knew uh, that, that this polyester film would work on. And, and like I said, they, they actually put that in their patent in 1951, okay? Yeah. So the, the idea that, that these other people, uh, other companies were the first is, is just really not true. Um, I'm looking at, there were 13 patents uh, between 1951 and 1968 for synthetic films and different types of uh, fastening systems, you know, for for synthetic films. Evans never got a patent for any of that. Remo's patent was the one that was successful, and that's what Remo's always said. You know, he said, we weren't, we've never been the first. There were so many people that tried, and actually Ludwig had uh, a, quite a bit more interaction with Remo, I think, than, than so that any other company at the time. Hmm. Uh, because there was a guy that had patented a synthetic head and, and uh, or he actually um, had an application in 51. Jim Irwin was the guy in 1955 who was really the first guy to do it. He worked at 3M and he had already been working with uh, Mylar for some eight years. And so he had... Um, put together a, uh, a drum head back in, I think, 52 or 53. Interesting enough, there's a there's some great history. John Beck's Encyclopedia of uh, Percussion is a great read for uh, some of the history of Mylar, and it talks about uh, those early days. Uh, Bill Ludwig's The Making of a Drum Company is another one. Yeah. But anyway, this was Jim Irwin's was back in 55, and he had made, you know, some sample drum heads uh, earlier than that. And, um, and so really, he was the first guy. And then, like I said, there were about 12 or 13 other people uh, that had designs that they actually patented. But uh, Remo's was the one that was uh, most successful. Yeah, And yeah. so it took off from there. Remo's was uh, in 57. So anyway, let me backtrack a little bit. Yeah. So Remo, as a touring uh, drummer, he was doing this show with Betty Hutton, who was a, uh, a Hollywood actress. Um, he would go to uh, Chicago, and then when they were uh, when they would make a stop in Chicago, he would go by Frank Strump's shop, he would go by Ludwig, and he would go by Slingerland. And, uh, and this is, again, well documented. There's um, lots of, uh, of information as far as the, the timeline and when he did these things. And, and, and again, I hope that one of these days um, Tom Zygmunt and I are going to be able to you know, publish a, a Remo history book. But so what happened then, this was, um, I think, about 53 or 54. He had... Um, gone by Frank Strum shop when he was in Chicago and then he went by um, Ludwig and then he went by Slingerland and at that time Bud Slingerland had shown him a Mylar drum head that he was working on and uh, Jim uh, Grawleman also worked at Ludwig and Selmer he was already working on Mylar drum heads back in around 53 I think it was and uh, so there were other people that were doing it but they just hadn't come up with the right you know, fastening means for it. You know, they had the film, but they just come up, couldn't come up with the fastening means. So while Remo was doing his, his touring thing, he was also a part owner, he and Roy Hart of uh, Drum City. As a touring drummer and also a drum shop owner, he was welcome in all of these these companies. He was welcome, you know, to the factories as a, like I said, as a potential customer sure. and as a player. And um, so they knew him, he knew them, he would see and, and check out different things that they were doing, but at the time, he wasn't interested in the plastic drum head. He had seen it, he just wasn't interested in it. Mm -hmm. So he gets back to Drum City, and then he was, uh, they were doing this percussion fair at Drum City, and he had gotten some Mylar from a distributor there um, in L.A., and he decided that he was going to do this uh, display. So he got some and he tacked it on a, um, a, 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 a drum to put in it as a window display. And he just used um, 
you know, staples and he tacked it on there, but he realized that the film was a little bit brittle at the time and the, the tacks and the staples would sort of tear the film. And so he did the display, but, you know, felt like that that wasn't going to be any, any great way of fastening the, uh, you know, the, the material to the frame. So then he gets a letter that was sent out uh, by, uh, by uh, Chick Evans uh, saying that he has this um, new plastic drum head. So the letter reaches Remo. Remo orders some heads. And, uh, and Roy Hart was actually a big session player at, um, at, you know, in L.A. at the time. That was Remo's partner. Uh, in Drum City. So Roy had actually used some of those heads, some of the Evans heads on some gigs. And even though there were problems with them, Remo said that, you know, they would, they would split and they would break and they would crack, but, you know, they would do enough to give people the idea of what Mylar sounded like and, you know, how it would perform in, in different weather conditions. So with that, when Remo got one of the flyers, he contacted, uh, Chick Evans. And so he made in a, um, and, and Remo's told the story many times to me, there's, there's quite a bit of, there, there's, uh, you know, I think everybody wants to hear the tawdry tidbits of, 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 you know, of what happened. But, but basically what happened when Remo got there, Chick had told him that he had, quote, a factory. Remo found him living in a boarding house. And he um, was in no, in no condition to talk about business whatsoever. Remo, they were actually doing a wholesale business at uh, Drum City as well as retail. So he was interested in, in, in buying the Evans heads as a wholesale uh, to become a distributor. Hmm. So he went to talk to Chick about, you know, what type of volume he had and if they would be able to supply, you know, all the customers because he was, Remo was going to try to promote it. And so when he got there, he was completely disenchanted about the whole situation. Uh, Chick actually offered to sell his, quote, factory, which was supposedly in the bottom basement of this boarding house. Remo never saw it, but he offered to sell whatever he had on inventory and and whatever, you know, else for like $5,000. And uh, Remo, when he got there and and, uh, Chick had shown him the sort of tacked head, he knew that that design wasn't any better than the stapled head that he had previously tried as a storefront window. Hmm. And um, he knew it wasn't going to hold up. Anyway, he got back and, again, completely uh, disenchanted about them being any sort of distributor for Evans drum heads. And then um, he he decided that, um, you know, what Evans had to offer w- just didn't work. Evans had already sent heads to uh, to Ludwig. Ludwig had tried them out, and they failed miserably. Hmm. And so Remo had, uh, between he and Roy Hart, they had initially purchased some, then they purchased more for other people that wanted to try them out. And, and Remo said in his own words many times, yeah, we tried to make the heads work. You know, we, we gave them out to customers. We used them. Um, you know, Roy used them on sessions, but they just didn't work. They didn't hold up. The design was just no good. And, you know, they, they didn't have any sort of form collar. So what, uh, basically what Chick had to offer just did not work. Okay. And, uh, and I think that's the biggest misconception there. You know, there's this concept that, well, Remo stole everything from Chick. Well, yeah. Chick didn't have anything to steal. I mean, it was, it was really, there was nothing that Chick had that, that Jim Irwin, the the guy that created the patent, you know, three years before uh, Chick Evans created these heads, there was nothing there um, that he had that was different from Jim Irwin's, hmm. and, you know, and it just didn't work. They didn't hold up. If they had, everyone would have bought them, and he would have been able to get a patent. Like I said, there were 13 patents held for drum heads during that 10-year period of time, and Evans didn't have any. So... Anyway, Remo goes back in 56, and like I said, they, they bought the heads, they used the heads, they tried to, uh, to sell the heads, but nobody wanted to, you know, to buy the heads again because, just because they didn't work, and that included the OEMs. And um, so at that time, Remo had an accountant, his name was Sid Gerwin, who uh, introduced him to an aerospace chemist. His name was Sam Munchnick. 
And he is actually on the very first Remo drumhead catalog. He's the guy that's pictured on there with like a <laughs> with like a chemistry beaker and <laughs> you know pouring some some stuff in yeah. there, you know, yeah. um, in in the very first catalog. So you know, with Remo's guidance, it was Sam that actually came up with the the actual idea of taking the aluminum channel and then pouring a resin into it because he was f- familiar with resins. Uh, most of the other companies were trying to do some other sort of a, uh, a crimped head and not a glued head. So anyway, with sort of all the other stuff behind Remo, with, with all the, the Slingon, the Ludwig, and the uh, the other companies, and the, the Jim Irwin. Actually, Jim Irwin uh, never really found anyone to uh, to try to take the reins on his patent because, again, what he had just didn't work, you know. I mean, he was one of the first guys to do it, but it just didn't work. Hmm. So when Remo got back, uh, he, they started playing around with some other designs, and, and uh, Sam ended up coming up with the design that, that basically they, they filed for a patent in 57. And then at that point in time, there was uh, two other people that uh, Premier actually had a glued head in 59 that they had a European patent on. Uh, there was another European patent in 58 that was a crimped head. Uh, two others. And uh, so other people, again, were trying to do this, but none of the, their designs were, were still any good. Hmm. So Ludwig ended up going with this crimp style head that they ended up getting from a guy over in Switzerland who was making basil drums. And uh, even Remo said that uh, the heads that he sent, the initial heads of the Mylar that he got had had received from DuPont, they actually couldn't take the tension of the marching drums that they were uh, doing over in uh, in Switzerland. So uh, there was a guy named Oscar Bauer who was doing uh, dry crimped heads, and um, Remo actually saw that process. And when he saw that, he still felt like that that wasn't the best design. He still felt like that the glued head was the best design because it still made the best sounding head. Even today, you can't make a good uh, two-ply crimped head uh, because you're contorting the two um, you know, plies of mylar. Hmm. You're sort of stretching them in different ways, and so you just don't get a very good sound. So anyway, Ludwig ended up basically taking that Switzerland design, bring, coming back in the 1960s, they started making their heads crimp. But again, interesting enough, between that period of 57 and 1960, it took a number of years for these uh, patents to come through. Remo had filed for it in 57, but it wasn't actually granted until 1960. Wow. So during that period, yeah, so during that period of time, uh, you know, the market had grown so much that um, Ludwig initially bought a number of heads from Remo, as did Slingerlin, as did Gretsch. Gretsch um, branded them Permatone. So they were buying heads from Remo for, you know, for quite some time. And then Ludwig started making a glued head uh, similar to Remo's. And at that point in time, and Remo says in his own words, during, during that whole time, there was no love loss. All the companies, it was like, you know, every man for himself because there was just such a demand you know, for plastic drum heads. Yeah, yeah. And so when Remo's patent was awarded, he actually went back to Ludwig and Slingerland and got them to actually uh, pay him uh, some royalties for the amount of heads that they had sold during those period of times because they basically copied his design. Sure. You know, but wow. um, yeah. And then getting back to the, the, the Evans situation, you know, uh, Chick Evans then decided that he would sell the business to Bob Beals, who was a, um, I think he owned a retail music store. He was actually an engineer. He had actually sold that business to him. And then they started making the uh, polyester flesh hoop design, which to me was another bad design. I mean, they, they weren't the first and and they, they certainly weren't the best, and then they took on another design that wasn't the best. Uh, but that's what they used for years until later, uh, again, they finally adopted, you know, the aluminum flesh hoop, and which is what Aquarian uses today. So the things that, uh, that Remo and Sam did way back in the, in the mid-50s are, are still, uh, the, you know, some of the designs that we use today as far as making the best-sounding drumhead. Yeah, and I think that's where that misconception came in of of 
of it was uh, like I thought it was this businessman Remo coming in and stealing the little guy's idea which obviously isn't true, and that's one of those misconceptions. Right. But um, it sounds like, right. like what I've learned in multiple episodes here are like things happen naturally, like music progresses in a certain way. Um, and now 20-something 20, exactly. 20 minutes in, I should have probably said for – most people know this, but the synthetic head came along because before that people were using animal skin heads that would be affected by weather, and that's why you get the Remo Weather King is because – this situation of you're 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 at the mercy of mother nature and when you're playing and your head would tighten and loosen so that's where that pursuit came from you know the 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 themes back then were remo created the weather king and you know ludwig was weather master and evans was all weather you know because they would they were trying to get that concept you know in people's heads that hey this this new and great material doesn't change, you know, and so Remo coined those sort of king themes, you know, like diplomat to the king, ambassador sure. to the king, and then emperor, which meaning king king itself, to actually denote the thickness of the mylar. So he was just way ahead of his time in in coming up with sort of those marketing terms yeah. that are still used today, That's you know. Amazing. But yeah, Weather King was what he developed and. And again, depending on how you parse the words, I think everybody wants to be the first and everybody wants to, to have a certain history and a, a certain brand loyalty. But, um, you know, Remo has said many, many, many times, you know, we he was never the first. He was never the first, but he was the first one that, that developed the system that worked. Yeah. Like I said, there's 13 patents. Um, during that time uh, of, of systems that did not work and other people that didn't that you know Evans never got a patent for his design and so there were other things that that were tried but they just didn't work and that's why they didn't take off yeah you know? yeah and it sounds like uh, like Remo didn't give up not to say that Evans or these other people gave up but it sounds like he tried a lot of things and he saw that okay this might be a little bit of a you know trial and error system right. but but he didn't give up and he stuck yeah. with it uh, no indefatigable is, is the term i use have always used for remo and he yeah. was like never tiring and even in his 80s uh, he would walk by my office here every day we would meet and talk drums i mean he loved drums with percussion and he he was just like I said, never tired of uh, working with it, doing things, experimenting, playing. So yeah, that was that was basically basically how it happened back then. And just to go back, um, just for one one other quick second yeah. about the Evans thing is that um, if anything, first of all, there was nothing for Remo to steal from Chick Evans. Okay, and if uh, if if anything, you know, Remo gave him, I think, more credit than what credit was due with the early samples that that they were trying to do. You know, at Drum City, you know, that they were trying to promote at Drum City because he tried to promote the heads. Yeah, and and like I said, they used them, but it was like Bill Ludwig said. If you put any tension on them whatsoever for any period of time, they would just break. You know? Now, to clarify yeah. that a little bit, so then, so so Remo would be yeah. in the business of selling drums at Drum City, and he approached Chick Evans to say, "Hey, let me try and distribute and sell this cool synthetic drum head you've got working on here." It didn't work out right, exactly. But he was trying to just right. say, "Hey, this is a good idea. Let's try and work together." And I can. He was probably thinking, "I can make money off of this just as a salesman, right?" Exactly. Well, that that was he. He never intended to go into business, and that's why wow. I say his the his his story is in three parts. First, as a working drummer. Second, as a you know as a as a distributor and a dealer at Drum City, and then the third part, becoming a manufacturer because he. You know, he started working with this chemist who came up with this idea. Remo said that he guided Sam, but I mean, he's given credit where credit is due, you know, over and over and over again. Sid Gerwin came up with the name and came up with the Remo name, and Sam came up with really design. And Remo was the one that was sort of guiding and directing and helping him because he was the drummer. You know, and they and he said that that he and uh, and Roy learned so much over the course of those next couple of years at Drum City because, you know, they were drummers and they were hanging with all the great drummers and all the players. Yeah. So, yeah, he was able to, to guide that and then develop that whole marketing thing. But 
But yeah, believe me, um, nothing can be further from the truth that Remo took advantage of uh, of that situation. There was just nothing to to take advantage of. And like I said, they they ended up doing their own thing, and and they made that polyester flesh hoop for years. Again, which I could probably talk to you for like days uh, on on drum head design and yeah. types of films and all those other. Things. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time towards the end. Uh, sure. To, to kind of talk about some of the other innovations that we we have here and what we've done. But um, anyway, you know, that's that's the history. And like I said, I've talked personally to Remo about uh, uh, all these stories over the years. Uh, Tom Zygmunt did a, um, a series of interviews uh, with Remo. Like I said, we're, we're trying to uh, publish this history book. And he would uh, meet with Remo on a day-to-day basis and did a lot of recording. So he's really documented the first 30 years of our existence, and and uh, I'm trying to document the last 30 years of our existence here. Cool. Yeah. And so that's coming straight from the horse's mouth, as well as other people that uh, will corroborate. Bill Ludwig has said in his book, and other other people. Uh, you know, and I actually think it's interesting that. You know, we even have in, in, our, in our old library, I'm looking at one of the, the 1964 Evans Meaning Catalog, and they put in here the historical and present-day facts. And this was back in 1964, and they just stayed right here. Chick was the first uh, to discover Mylar being ideal, was the first to be an ideal for drum heads by tacking the Mylar to the wood flesh hoop. Hmm. There's just so much history before that of people that, that had already received, that already had patents and things like that, that just completely negate that. But if you write your own uh, catalog, I guess you can say whatever you want. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> but so then, so if we're moving forward here, so then like, um, like I'm on your website, it's cool to think like the Remo crown logo. Yeah, it was the king, it was the crown, it was that whole king theme. Yeah. The wearing the crown, the king wearing the crown, the diplomat, the ambassador, the emperor, that was, you know, that was sort of the whole marketing strategy of it. And that's how the crown came about. Sure. You know, he was the weather king. And so there you have the crown. So, yeah, the crown went through a number of variations. And actually, I've got to take a second here because I, I, I have a bunch of these old uh, heads in my office. I get uh, other collectors and people that send me things that that have been made in original boxes, all these things. Yeah. I've got some original Weather King drumsticks. I even have some clarinet pads. Remo, would, do you know that Remo made clarinet pads? I did not. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what is, mean, a, what we, is a clarinet pad? I, I, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it, basically what it does is it, uh, you know, when, when you press the pads over an open hole, like if you have a recorder or a flute, yeah. it stops that hole. And uh, so there's these little mylar uh, pads with um, uh, with almost like felt on them. But, um, but, you know, at that time, Remo was, it was all about band and, and orchestra instruments. It wasn't about guitars and amplifiers like it was in the 70s. And so Remo, uh, he was trying to get Remo Incorporated involved in all these band and orchestra things. And so he wanted, um, he told me this, we were talking about some of the old things that we've, you know, that I have collected. And he was just saying that, yeah, he he had a number of people that were really bright and so knowledgeable in so many areas that he wanted to sort of build the company into, into selling a number of accessory products. And so he had drumsticks, he had practice pads. We, you know, like I said, he made these these clarinet pads, uh, some other really sort of wacky things. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, like I said, he 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 was just so into what he did. And at the time, if there was an accessory that he thought uh, that that he could make that would be an improvement and it would be a useful item, then he would certainly do it. It's cool to just think of the the passion that he had right away. Now. Was Remo an yeah. was it an instant success? Was it just like instantly this blew up and everyone adopted it very quickly and said, I mean, I can't see too many people saying, no, I prefer um, animal skin heads. Was it just overnight, you know, yeah. money rolling in? Absolutely, and that's what we what we like I said plan to do eventually when we get this boat together. When when the when the corporation was created, when uh, Remo Inc. Uh, came about, uh, Remo attended the Tri-State Music Festival in Oklahoma 
And um, after that show, he came back um, uh, with with sales that totaled over twenty five hundred dollars. Um, and um, just in that one show, and the group they they grew enormously with like sales totaling over thirty seven thousand dollars by the end of the month. I mean, it was just overnight, and and they outgrew a five hundred square foot. Um, quote factory and I say that in the loosest terms I've seen pictures <laughs> they moved to a thousand square foot a place in uh, in Santa Monica near Vine Street and then uh, after that they started hiring other people they actually made um, you know these forming dies they could do things fast initially they just had these little sort of uh, heat strips that would go around the head and form it and uh, I mean it was really no you know, no real big production. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, because because he had all the OEM sales as well as the dealer sales, um, it was just overnight success. You know, it was, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, sell, selling an app today, you know, yeah. people say, oh, wow, is it $2 million overnight? Well, Jeez. it was almost like that. Yeah. And now the OEM sales are referring to uh, Remo selling to Ludwig and then Ludwig putting their name right. on it. Got it. Got it. Which right. which happens all the right. time. I mean, that's yeah. that's that happens today. Pearl and all these people, they have you got to have drum heads on exactly. your new drum set. Right. And, you know, and to this day, we've we've, um, we've we've got such a great relationship with all the OEM companies, you know, whether it be Pearl, Drum Workshop, Ludwig, whomever. Ludwig uses our actually Ludwig stopped a couple of years ago making their own heads and they use our heads now. And uh, with their name on, we put their name on it. And if they want, you know, some little different uh, difference in 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 the type of film that we use, or the type of collar, or the type of uh, flesh hoop, then we'll do it because we make you know a tremendous amount of means of fastening the film now. You know, sure. we have crimp style, we have uh, crimp lock, we have uh, four different kinds of timpani uh, insert rings. We we have all this because what we do is we look at the end use, you know? And uh, so, yeah, the OEMs were a big part of that. Yeah, I'm getting off subject here. Sorry no, 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 no. <laughs> I say let's move forward in the timeline. So we're in the 60s. So it's it's happened. Yeah. Remo is getting popular. It is popular. It's an overnight success. What was going on in the 60s then? Obviously, Ringo played Remo. Right. That's got to be a big deal. Oh yeah, it was huge. Well, and and CS um, when when the CS dots came about, that ended up becoming huge because you know it was a look too. I think even early on in the early days, people were fascinated that a transparent film could be so strong. Sure. And you had fives and the, some transparent drums being made, and people just thought it's all oh, you know it's the Jetsons. It's like you know it's like this really <laughs> cool new kind of thing. You know, it's this transparent film that. That I can hit as hard as I want to, and I can't break it. Yeah. And um, so Remo said that the whole CS thing really came. Uh, well, it, it it goes way way back to tabla drums, really. Even P3, if you look at the way tabla drums were made and the gobs that are put on there, the the way it it sort of keeps the film from twisting and makes it more of a trampling motion, so you get more of a fundamental sound. So. What happened there was uh, Buddy uh, Buddy Rich was using these uh, wood beaters on his bass drum, and it was denting the head really bad in some cases. You know, back then, Buddy and Louie, they all used Diplomat, and um, so it was seven and a half mil film, and so it would break. So Remo put a patch on it, and because it was a clear patch, nobody could see it. Yeah. And so he said, well, you know, let's uh, let, let's make it where it's black, so or, you know, like what he did with Pinstripe. Let's accent the fact. Let's don't try to hide it, you know? And um, so anyway, again, he was a visionary as far as marketing these things. And he, he started doing the, the CS Black Dot and coupled that with the transparent heads. And, you know, you had Bonham and you had uh, Vistalite and you had all that stuff. And bam, before you knew it, again, it was another rave there and, um, and another big wave of drum heads that were unique sounding and also unique in their appearance. And it's kind of one of those things where, you know, every kid in America, or I should say every kid around the world, 
is watching a big drummer like John Bonham or like Ringo. And if they're oh, playing yeah. Remo, that's like, yeah. it's product placement, basically. That's, you know, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, exactly. I I know so, so, so many drummers during that time, you know, I talked about just dreaming over the, that Ludwig Vista Light catalog and just that whole, you know, yeah. just that whole look, that was it, you know. But again, the sound was great. And, and then you, you started getting a lot of uh, recorded sounds that wanted more fundamentals. I know Remo said that uh, that uh, Hal Blaine and, and uh, Steve Gadd were like huge proponents of those heads. And all the recordings were done with those. And, and, and everybody wanted that sound. And Hawaii Five-O soundtracks and you name it. Sure. Everybody wanted that sound. And uh, and then the marching drum it made it better too because it made it more durable. You yeah. know, so marching snare had started the NCS. That really took off in the seventies as well as sparkle tone. You know, sparkle tone, that was sort of another thing I wanted to address. Maybe I don't know if I could uh, jump in here right now and Go talk for it. about that. But yeah. um the way we do uh the the, the actual um Graphic heads that were done back in the day, like Sparkle Tone and some of the other uh, four color sill screens, those were innovative because they just had graphics. They weren't innovative because of the, necessarily the process or necessarily the sound. What we have now with, with our Skin Deep is a, a very, very unique process that uh, actually Tom and I both, we, we hold a patent for that. And that's a process that's literally like a tattoo on your skin. It 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 uh, the the inks actually go down into the pores of the film. You'll never get it off, and we put that on our tried and true films, our tried and true Dupont films, and so there's no change in sound. So that technology is really different. It's not just basically painting the head with a polyester ink or, Got it. or a silk screen. It, it is totally different. Cool. It's big and it's a human. It was something that we started back in 1996. And if you look at any of our the cores and the college bands, if you look at and listen to any of those heads, uh, there's just nothing that can compare with it. The other mm. companies uh, still do surface printing and, uh, and and do laminations on top of that, which change the sound of the heads. And so. Our process is totally different, totally unique, and, uh, and and it's not anything like it was back in the 70s. But that showed back then that people were looking for something new and different when Sparkle Tone came out. People were looking for something that, you know, that when it was put on television that it it made a splash. Yeah, you know? that is um, definitely a technology that I didn't realize went back that far. It's really cool to know that it was like, yeah. I mean, Remo's very innovative in that way. And and as I'm looking on the timeline here, um, something that I've always had a pair of, and I think a lot of people have a pair of, is the Roto Toms. I mean, they're such a cool technology. Yeah. Well, in recording, like I said, they used those in, uh, I, I think, the early versions of Y50, where people sort of got that sound, and Digu Chancellor started using them. And uh, he w- he was like the guy to a lot of uh, Phil Collins, I think, and some other people. Vic Firth ended up uh, promoting them, uh, some of the larger sizes of, as practice timpani when we came out with the pitch pedal that was mated to that. And uh, so, yeah, they were, they were definitely innovations, and they had a unique sound because there was no shell, uh, you know, for the head to resonate on. It, it, it had a very unique uh, kind of uh, timber to it. Yeah, and those, those went through well. I mean, they're still around, obviously, but I feel like those were in the 80s. You see um, just yeah, tons yeah. of people using them there, which it's, it's very, very iconic. But um, backing up into, so Rototoms were, as it says here, in 68. So that seems early on for that technology. What else is happening around that time? Mainly during that time, it was more about uh, film thicknesses being changed and some of the, pro- some of the different kinds of, of films. Um, you know, at the, at the time, there, were, there was a 3 mil film, a 5 mil film, and a 7.5 mil film. Then you, we we started getting 10 mil films, which then became the ambassador, uh, a single ply ambassador. And uh, as people started, you know, like I said, as uh, amplification came in and drummers had to compete with guitars, um, they needed something uh, that was really strong. And so 10 mil film is extremely strong. It has a nice attack to it versus a two ply head, you know, which is going to be a little bit more warm. Yeah, uh, sure. You know, not not have have quite the punch. So um, so a lot of that was about coatings for brushes, 
different things like that that Remo did early on and then the film thickness and then the improvements. Remo says, um, and uh, like I said, these are some of the things that I was listening to and, and some of the audio things. Some of the earlier um, Mylar that we had gotten from DuPont uh, in the late 50s wasn't as good as the Mylar that they had in the mid 60s because the mid 60s they actually opened up a new plant they were making it up in Delaware then they opened up a new plant uh, which started making this other type of Mylar which was a 10 mil and at that point in time they started making the film and and Remo said that, that he worked with a number of those um, uh, chemists at DuPont to give us some things that, that 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 their other customers didn't want nor cared about, you know. Yeah. So um, so yeah, there were things going on in the '60s, but I think it was more related to to like the Melanex and the Mylar um, types of films. Sure. Cool. And, uh, and like I said, we we still we still use those today. It's amazing to me that some of those films that were developed back then have certain harmonics that are. Um, that are uh, they have no dissonance to them. There are so many films that I get today, whether it be for solar panels or whether window uh, film uh, treatments or whatever, uh, or you know for tinted windows. The films they 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 have these really uh, bad harmonics, and uh, for the most part they're hard to tune. And so the films that we use, like our black film, for instance, is the same film that we use for our coated ambassador. Let's say we don't take an, an, an existing window treatment film like some of the other companies do and, um, and, and make a drum head out of it. We make it out of a film that we know that sounds good. And in most cases, it's a little bit more expensive because we have to take that film and then we have to do the dye process to it. But it gives you a better sound. Yeah, so that's why we do it. It pays to do it right. Um, right. So, okay. So if that's the '60s, then getting into the '70s and '80s and pushing forward here, what was going on then? It seems like dampening in the '70s and '80s. You get more of that. Uh, I like to think of it as like the Steve Miller band, that kind of like muffled yeah. sound. Yeah. So I'm sure things got more. Yeah. You get more of the uh, the dot and all that stuff. Absolutely, and and that's when Pinstripe sort of took over. Pinstripe has this. Uh, spray that goes between the, the the two layers and what that does is add some weight in that area and it takes away the higher frequencies and so it gives you a, a much darker and a warmer sound and that's what they were after back then yeah in the late 70s and early 80s that was it but um also during that time we we started making uh, woven heads and our, our marching line started to expand quite a bit because the uh, with the um, uh, integration of uh, Kevlar and Technor and some of the other uh, airmed fibers, the marching uh, snare drum companies wanted something they could really tension tight and get a, a really precise sound. What they're trying to do there is they have 10 guys playing a certain pattern and, and they want them to sound like one. Yeah. So for that to happen, because the articulation is so tight, uh, the drum head has to be able to produce those really tight, short, staccato kind of notes. So we got into um, to doing the marching Kevlar heads, and that has grown tremendously over the years. To now, we we actually use um, you know a few different types of airmed products and a few different kinds of weaves. Um, the weaves on our Black Max and our Cyber Max are completely different, and what that does is gives the drummer a different feel. Uh, one has a little bit more bounce. It's kind of like a you know a, a certain amount of air in a basketball. Just a little bit more, you get a, a little bit more bounce. A little less, you get a little less. So that's sort of what the weaving does. It sure. gives you, it gives the guy some options there in addition to sound. It gives him a, a feel option. Huh. So while we're in the '80s, um, and I've always I've always wondered about this. I've always seen them, and I never knew what the deal was with it. So Remo making drum sets. How did that come about, and what's yeah. the story behind that? <laughs> well, that is a really long story. I'll try to make it really short. <laughs> so most companies, uh, when they come out with a drum set, they, they make it the best possible set they can do, and they, they have one or two models. They have you know different configurations. And then later on, after that gets established, then they come up with a student line model or something, right? Yep. So Remo uh, came up with this uh, pre-tuned head, which was incredible. It was um, it, it was an amazing thing, which was really happened by accident. A 
but again, it's a long story. But he came up with this pre-tuned head, and so to promote the pre-tuned head, um, it was um, it was supposed to be a fairly inexpensive item. But all the drum shells and all the because the head didn't need all this heavy-duty tension hardware. It was already pre-tuned. Hmm. All it needed was some sort of latch to hold it on the shell. So Remo's uh, introduction into drums uh, came about from the low-end market. So all he wanted was a very inexpensive drum shell that he could put a, a PTS head on, okay? So what he did was he initially got, uh, you know, some, some tubes that they used to pour concrete with, and he hardened those up and, and uh, put pre-tuned heads on, and bam, he was in business. He had a very inexpensive product. And the drum sounded really good, uh, you know, because the heads were so good. They were already pre-tuned. You didn't have to have all this heavy hardware. So he wanted to make a number of um, of, of ethnic drums, you know, mm-hmm. with that whole pre-tuned system. And uh, and so that's really how we got into the drum set world. The, then the major uh, drummers, like uh, when Louis Belson started um, tinkering around with him, because Louis um, was a was just a, a great person and a huge ambassador, no pun intended, to our company. And even we <laughs> were friends. And so Louis started actually uh, playing the PTS drum set. But one of the problems that he was having was the fact that the hardware was so lightweight that it, it just wouldn't hold up. You know, he loved the sound of the drums, but they just didn't hold up. And so eventually, when, when Louis came on board and then we, we, we got some other artists that came on board, they all said basically the same thing. The PTS heads had an aluminum uh, hoop on them and they couldn't do a decent cross stick. It needed to be steel. Yeah. And, you know, they, they had a, all these other things that they were trying to do that they really couldn't do with, with PTS because they wanted it to be at a level that it was never really meant to be. And so what happened was the market actually forced him into making a a drum set that had counter hoops and all the heavy lugs. And I was part of that. Uh, I was part of that design and all all the lugs and all the things that we did, uh, you know, over the next number of years. But initially he got into it because all he wanted to do was promote an inexpensive uh, pre-tuned drum head. Interesting. So it it really didn't matter about the actual drum set itself. It wasn't meant to be like a competitor for Ludwig at that time. It was just a way to promote, obviously, the the, the technology right, and the drum. Right. Heads. And we had and and even one of the biggest sellers back at that time was the Junior Pro. Um, you know, because the Junior Pro kit was all pre tuned. It was really lightweight. Uh, it was a great sounding set. And again, it, it was never meant to be a, a you know a high end drum set. Yeah, well, and you you bring up a good point though about talking about the world percussion, like the djembes and all that stuff, which Remo makes unbelievable hand right. percussion. I mean, I've played and owned the djembes right. and stuff, and um, I think from what I can see, that was in the '90s, correct? Right, and that's uh, another one of those things that I would really love to drill down and talk about all the details. I over the years, I've kept really good notes, day-to-day notes, literally on everything that we've made and some of the prototypes and the, the artists that we work with and how the concepts came about and what they ended up being. And I'm just totally passionate about that whole thing because, like I said, that was during my time. And uh, so there was a chemist that we had here um, who uh, helped us develop a lot of those um, those things. and. We learned quite a bit about how we can vary the sound of acoustic iron shells because it's interesting that when you have like a drum set tom-tom, you know, you want it to be as resonant as possible and you want the thing to ring for, you know, uh, a whole note and a dotted half Mm -hmm. and and versus something that that has a very um, quick kind of a tone. So a lot of the world percussion instruments... If you make those like we would, we would initially make some of the djembes and some of the other material out of really. We would make the shells really hard and resonant because we could control the amount of um, resin that we put into the shell and how how you know we could harden it up and how we could um, make it vibrate. So in, early on, we found out that we didn't want that for wall percussion. Every time we'd make a shell that was so resonant, uh, we would get uh, an artist that would come in and was like, man. 
you got to do something about that. It rings forever. It gets in the way. The bass gets in the way of the high notes and this. And so what we ended up doing was catering the different products uh, to different hardnesses, you know, in the shell to, to give them, you know, more of an authentic sound. And even like the, the heads that we have now, they represent a goat skin head. So if we have a Egyptian dunbeck, we want that to be like a, you know, like a fish skin, like what they do what they're used for so um anyway it's about the shell it's about how it resonates it's about the design of it if you take like our djembe if you widen that waist it becomes almost like a um a helmholtz resonator if you know what that is it's like blowing in a coke bottle yeah so if you if we widen that waist a little bit it will change the frequency from like 80 you know uh to a to a higher frequency you know and um so you can you can do all these things and uh and those were just fun things to experiment with because we had the option of of um of molding the shell the way we wanted to mold it and um making the film with whatever lamination we wanted sure those things have, have always been fun and continue to be fun you know yeah me. <laughs> i mean remo you guys are kind of masters in resonance whatever that is the absolutely the art of things resonating and you hit it with a stick and make it sound good and uniform and there are so many different varieties of um of drum heads obviously and as i'm looking through your history too one thing i think that's cool is your guys involvement mm-hmm. with the olympics there's obviously multiple things on the timeline where you guys are featured oh, in, yeah. in the yeah. olympics i mean that yeah. doesn't get much bigger than that no, it doesn't. And, and actually, uh, Remo and I went to the Summer Olympics in 96. Uh, we made these gigantic uh, drums um, that they did for the opening ceremonies. And I was actually there for the opening ceremonies when we did this wow. the week before and during that time. And, and it, it just incredible uh, things that happened because we, we, we made these gigantic drums. I think the smallest drum was a 30-inch they were like 30, 32, 34, 36, and 40 inches. And they had these humongous depths to them. And, uh, yeah, they were just really cool, fun things to work on, you know. That's but, awesome, uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's like you said, we 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 look at what the end result uh, needs to be. You know, does it need to be resonant? Does it not to be? Does it not need to be? Does it? Um, I did this. Uh, I, I rented a camera that actually records uh, drum heads at, at like a high speed, like 10,000 frames a second. Cool. Because I was, I, w- I was working on um, a couple of designs that I couldn't really figure out what was going on. And what's, what's so unique about it is you could see how the drum head works and, and the way it's being played. Like, for instance, if a guy plays like a slap on a djembe, um, the way that his hands hit that head, it makes the head like a graphic equalizer. <laughs> so basically, he's he he turns the dial to get more of the high frequencies and almost no low. Yeah, right? yeah. But then if you take the, the the base of your hand and you you hit the head, you can see the head has more of like a big trampoline effect, and and the whole head goes up and down, and you get only that low note. <laughs> and when you play all these other tones in between, that's what gives you the sort of the open tone, the slap tones and the bass tones and whatever, you're basically making that head vibrate by the way you strike it. And that same thing happens with different kinds of sticks and different types of mallets. And so, again, it's a fascinating thing when you see it, uh, when, when you actually can see it uh, the way it works. You know, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. So obviously we could talk about Remo and what happened in the past all day long. But what I'm curious about now as we kind of wrap (laughs) up is what can we look forward to in the future? Like, is there anything new you guys are working on right now that you're, you're allowed to talk to us about? Yeah, I, we have got so much on our plate right now. There's, there's two things. I, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell you what they are, but they (laughs) are going to be really cool. Uh, (laughs) um, uh, it, uh, one in, in a, it involves uh, uh, some new mesh uh, drum heads. Oh, cool! Uh, and uh, we we got some new marching stuff coming along as well. Cool. And um, yeah, so there's um, th- there's there's quite a bit of things that we're working on, and also some other things that we we continue to work with our OEM partners and and uh, with artists. And um, 
you know, it, it, it's like I said, I, I have to pinch myself every day because I, I just love what I do here. And I think we're sort of like the Baskin Robbins. Uh, you know, we have so many flavors and you mix a little bit here and there yeah. and we can get what, you know, what, what people want. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so we, we've got just a tremendous amount of things uh, That's great. on our plate right now. We've got uh, so many things going on as far as drum heads and, and world percussion. And um, yeah. yeah, we we we're keeping in Remo's uh, indefatigable yeah spirit. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone needs a uh, go to you know Remo dot com to buy Remo drum heads. I think everyone out there knows where to find them. But one thing I think that I can highly recommend is on your guys' website under the company tab. There is uh, the history. And there's a ton of information right. that goes really in depth, and that's what I've been following along with. So you can go through here, and there is so much more than we talked about. Honestly, I feel like we could talk for four hours about this. Uh, um, well, yeah, we we well definitely because, like I said, I, I mean, I'm I, I know I'm a geek when it comes to this stuff, but <laughs> I mean, as far as the the technology and you know the the tools that we have today too, the digital world, we do 3D modeling, 3D printing, we do all the. The, the sort of the latest stuff and like I said high speed videos that, that actually show how the heads vibrate so yeah. we, we have all this technology we have these machines that we design to test the heads and you can actually see that on our YouTube page if you look at our it, it's I think it's called a drum machine you can look at those are one of the machines that we built to test bass drum heads and um, you know we just have so many things going on and like I said I'm, I'm just uh, proud of everything that we do here and that's great I, you know, besides being a drummer myself, I have friends that are drummers and, you know, artists, and we all want everything to work really well. Yeah. And um, and so, like I said, I'm really, really excited about some of the newer things that we have coming up. That's awesome. It's good to be good to be proud of your company. And uh, and before we wrap up, I want to give a shout out to. Um, so I met at the Chicago Drum Show Brian Levan, who um, it was unbelievably nice and actually got us connected. So I just want to give a big thank you to right. him and just say that it's you guys as a company have been very you know open and just coming right on the show and and it's just it's just awesome and then also a shout out to which i never thought i'd get to stay but uh stan bicknell who's a great drummer everyone knows him on uh social media and stuff he's the one who told me hey you should get you should get remo's side of the story on drum heads because he's a big fan of remo and all oh, that yeah. so um yeah. shout out to those two guys Whoa. yeah yeah, well, Bart, thanks so much. I really, really appreciate it. And like I said, we, um, we, uh, on the contrary, I, I actually love giving tours when people come in, especially artists that are into what we do. You know, yeah. Because I, besides just coming up with some, you know, a, a lot of times other companies just come up with some kind of marketing gimmick or whatever, and and I can tell you all the reasons that it doesn't work, you know, when you look at it from an engineering side and from a recording sure. side or, or from a performance side. And I absolutely love uh, when people come in here and we can physically show them what we do, why we do it the way we do it, what films we use and how we do it. Because like I said, we, we absolutely have nothing to hide. Um, you know, our only uh, problem right now is just, how to disseminate all the information you know, yeah. because now with the web and, and everybody having their own camera and their own videos or whatever uh, it, it gets you know obviously there's some things that we want to keep throughout ourselves uh, sure. and other things that, that we're more than welcome you know to, to, to show the public why we're different uh, and, you know versus the other companies yeah. so yeah we, we certainly want to be transparent and um, and like I said, we, I'd love for you to come into the factory, and we can show you all the things that we talked about. That would be great. That would be great. You're a uh, you're a great ambassador of the company, and that is a pun that I intend to right <laughs> there. But um, all right, Herbie, thanks again for taking the time to talk with me today. Great, Bart. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. All right, we'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.